uh, quite a few people join in attendance, so uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Jamie Hayden. I'm the president of the Grayson Jockey Club Research Foundation. We're happy to uh, host, the, once again, the ninth Welfare and Safety of the Racehorse Summit. Um, as you know, we've had to cancel our in-person, so now we're, we're all from either home or various places around the country uh, contributing to the uh, health and welfare of these great animals, the horse. Uh, a lot of great guests uh, scheduled <clears throat> over the uh, webinars, but today we're going to focus on a veterinarian panel with the importance of transparency in medical records and monitoring horses between starts. Uh, Dr. Dion Benson, the Chief Veterinarian Officer from the Stronach Group, is going to moderate uh, with Dr. Ryan Carpenter, a private practitioner from Equine Medical Center in Cypress, California. Dr. Will Farmer, who is the Equine Medical Director at Churchill Downs Incorporated. And Dr. Scott Palmer, the Equine Medical Director at the New York State Gaming Commission. Uh, they've got a lot of questions and conversations amongst themselves and at the bottom of your um, <clears throat> at the bottom of your um, interface there on your attendee, you should have a Q&A button and uh, type any questions you have in uh, and we'll get to them at the end. So uh, now I'm going to disappear and uh, turn it over to uh, Dr. Benson. And again, I'd like to thank everybody for taking their time today under these circumstances. Uh, these individuals have a lot going on right now. Some of them are taking breaks from uh, treating animals. Others have just gotten reassignments uh, back to the racetrack. So thanks again, doctors, for uh, taking your time today. You're thanks, welcome. Jamie. Um, I, first of all, welcome to everyone. We've got a really great panel here today, uh, you know, between people with decades of experience, private practitioners, and people who are actually just new to, the, relatively new to their role, um, but have a lot of experience in racing. Uh, one of the areas that Jamie asked me to touch on was transparency in medical records. And really, I just want to have a, a Q&A with you guys. You've got a ton of experience. And, um, you know, I think talking about some of these things will benefit everyone and we can uh, cover a lot of ground. Um, when we're talking about transparency in medical records, what does that mean to each of you? For example, who do we think should have the information, how much information, you could kind of each walk me through your perspective and what um, medical records should be available. Um, I know Dr. Palmer, you guys have done some of this in New York, so maybe you want to start off. Sure. Um, on general terms, I like to separate this question down into a few different categories. And I like to think of it that some of the information in horse racing is used exclusively for a regulatory purpose. Uh, other information is, is intended for use by racing stakeholders. And finally, there's information that is prepared for public distribution. And with these different audiences uh, and their different needs, I think we have to be uh, attentive to those differences and our, our information needs to be packaged for, for those different audiences. Um, I think that uh, one of the questions that you alluded to or put in our little brochure here was, how much information should be available? And I think that's a really tough question because we run into a conflict where there are folks, and I would be included in this category, I think mostly that when I break down the information, I think about, well, what's the need to know basis for the information? And then you're, you're in conflict with folks that have a want to know basis. You know, and, and I think you know, trying to reconcile these two different perspectives is, is a challenge. But um, I know we're going to get into a few things later on. I have some examples of things we've done in New York that I think has been, have been really helpful. But we do have a philosophy in our commission to be very transparent with the public. And we have, uh, as we'll talk about a little bit later, some, some requirements within 72 hours of, of our major stake races that people have to uh, make public their, their medical records, which has been a real challenge. Uh, but something that's people have come to, to become uh, used to that, and we're doing that on a regular basis. And Dr. Carpenter, as a private practitioner, you're kind of on the other side of this. I know that, you know, you're very progressive and, and you know the importance of, of transparency in racing. What are your concerns as you hear the phrase transparency in medical records? Yeah, so for me, it's real simple. I think the regulatory body in whatever state you're working in should have access to everything you do. Um, I think you should be very accurate in how you report your, your information um, and not only um, in just the paper um, format that we turn into HRB, but also conversations that would take place with um, the regulatory vets. 
I found that that's the best way to develop a working relationship that puts the horse's best interest. Um, we've all seen those um, horses that might have something questionable on a pre-race examination, but when you have a working relationship with those regulatory veterinarians and they've seen your, um, your approach over the weeks leading up to that race, you can give them great confidence um, that that horse is not um, an at-risk individual um, by sharing everything you've done. So I don't think there's anything wrong with sharing absolutely everything you've done with the people within our industry. Where it becomes a little um, different for me, and I think Scott touched on this perfectly, is um, the want-to-know group. And so, you know, what do you make public just to the general public? And that's tough because um, – there's a lot of conversations that take place with the owner or the trainer about the diagnostic approach to that horse that without the context of the conversation, it gets lost. And so people can start drawing inferences and assumptions that are not true or correct um, because it tells the story that they may want to tell. So from um, a transparency to the public, I, I don't think the nitty gritty details are important. Um, but a summary of what's going on, I think, is is fine. Some way that you can convey to them what um, the conversations that took place leading up to either the race or the surgery or, you know, the MRI or the PET scan or the CTO. Those things, I think, are all very, very important. And, and Dr. Farmer, you and I are in very similar positions in that we both represent the association, not the regulator, but the association. So in some cases we are a little bit at a disadvantage in that we don't get access to the confidentials, but we're still trying to make decisions for horses. Um, for example, when at Santa Anita, we have vets that examine horses on a daily basis, but don't necessarily have any information about what has happened to those horses with the exception of, you know, vets who are willing to talk to us about, about things that have been done. How do you see this challenge and how do you approach it from your position at Churchill? And I'll just let you know you're muted right now. Thank you. Um, yeah, it is, it is a big challenge from our side. Um, and, you know, having spent many, many years as a regulator, adjusting to the association side it is a big challenge um, because the, same, the amount of information that I'm able to receive is, is very different. Um, but I think it, it, is, it is a team approach where uh, from a, an association side, working with the regulatory bodies to be able to um, work together. Obviously, like you said, we don't see that information, the confidentials. Uh, what we have done in our Churchill properties are require the exams prior to entry. And so those we do get to see because that's our house rule. So we do get to see those exams. But with regards to individual treatments, we don't. And so there is a, a hole from our side, but we working together closely with the regulatory body, we can try to help complete that picture um, the best. Because from my side, what, what I have to work with are mostly just PPs, looking at work patterns uh, and layoff patterns for horses to try to do a brief cursory risk management for those horses. Yeah, so it sounds like we're all in agreement that there is some access that should be given to certainly the regulator, maybe a little less um, agreement on, on what should happen vis-a-vis -vis the general public. Um, I know that I think it's a very difficult thing to look at anyone else's medical record and understand why they made decisions that they made. So I, I appreciate those, um, that perspective. Um, Dr. Carpenter, do you think that the best people to keep these records is truly the veterinarians, the trainers, should it be a hybrid? Who do you think should be responsible for maintaining all the horse's records? I think it's a, a combination of both the trainer and the veterinarian. I think the veterinarian, um, understands the importance of attention to detail. Um, and so the, your general veterinarian is going to be very specific in everything that they write down. Um, but we also have to acknowledge the fact that there are, um, in some instances, um, trainers that either will treat horses, say, with a dantrium to prevent them from tying up while they're training. And while the veterinarian may not specifically know what horse was given it on which day, I think that's the trainer to really help complete the picture. Um, in terms of the complete medical record so that there is completeness in what's the horse is um, really being done to the horse on an er everyday basis. Do you think that there's some, some concern or some risk in um, having like the trainer make a decision on whether the horse should have a medication? Should that be done in concert with the vet? 
Um, or I know, for example, in some cases, they actually require the vet to sign off on the medical record that the trainer keeps to ensure that they're informed, you know, just general pharmaceutical knowledge to make sure we don't have any um, bad drug interactions or anything. Absolutely. And I think um, the, the very, the, the coolest thing I, I find with being a backside racetrack practitioner is the relationships that I develop with my trainers and my assistant trainers on a daily basis. These are people that I see every single day. Um, and a lot of times more frequently and for longer periods of time than my family. And so there's this perception that trainers are just giving medications at whim. And that's really not true. What's happening is over the course of honestly decades, you've developed a working relationship. And so, you know, where an outsider might look at it when I walk into a barn and the trainer says, Hey doc, can we do a bone scan on this horse behind? Cause he's just not going right. Is the trainers calling the shots? But what really has happened is over the years of working with this trainer, we've painted the value in doing the bone scan procedure. They recognize that. And so their way of saying is, hey, I'm not comfortable with this way, this horse behind. Can you look at it? And then can we do the next step forward? And so sometimes that happens with simple medications like, say, Dantrium, for example. Maybe the horse ties up the trainer and the veterinarian have a conversation and then the prescriptions given. So should a trainer just have access to the back of the veterinary truck and just do what they want when they want to? Absolutely not. But when they work in concert with their veterinarian and their tight relationship, I think a lot of those decisions are being made um, in, in a very constructive manner um, that may not appear that way from an outsider looking in. And Dr. Palmer, one of the things that I hear often as we try to implement new rules and new regulations is, well, it doesn't matter because you're never going to be able to enforce it. And this is certainly one of those instances where we have to think about how we're going to enforce record keeping rules. Can you talk about how you've done that in New York? Sure. The, um, the, you're right. The camp, some of these rules can be very difficult to enforce, but there are, there are um, I don't know whether you want to call them uh, points of conflict or points of contention that can occur. For example, right now, as you know, we're doing a quite a bit of, of hair testing on horses that have been uh, in the custody and control of trainers indicted for alleged, you know, uh, illegal use of medication. So we are uh, compiling a, a large number of test results in these horses. And at the same time, we are uh, asking all of the, well, we're actually requiring if they don't, we, we ask, but if they don't give it to us, we subpoena them. But when, to be polite about it, we're asking all these owners to provide medical records of these horses from December 19 through uh, the day that they had their hair test done. So what we're going to be doing is comparing those medical records uh, or treatment records with our test results. And if everything lines up, then there is no problem whatsoever. But if we have, if we have evidence of a prescription drug in a horse, and there is no prescription, or there's no medical record that the veterinarian even gave the drug, then that represents an, an area of exposure for that trainer for regulatory action. So that's just an example of, of one way of doing this, but it, it's the kind of thing where a person could uh, get away with a lot for a period of time, but, but once in a while there comes these moments when you have a regulatory process they get caught up in and there's enormous consequences for it. So I think these things are enforceable. It's not a perfect system, but it's a good system. And Dr. Farmer, I know, sorry, go ahead. I was, I would, I was just gonna add, um, you know, and I think part of the enforcement of trying to be able to take this vast volume of data. I mean, we, when we talk about treatment records, it seems very simple when we're talking about a horse. But when you're looking at, you know, Santa Anita, close to 2,000 horses a day. At Churchill Downs, we have 1,400 horses a day that are being treated. The volume of information that is coming in on a daily basis uh, is enormous. And then trying to uh, decipher handwriting and, you know, is this, a, it, it was this done this way or that way based on, on how it's written uh, can be really challenging. So I think one of the other steps that we need to look towards is, you know, a, a consensus of trying to get to a electronic medical record that's consistent across the board. And, you know, your experience, you, when you were with the regulatory side in Kentucky, you guys did a lot of auto competition testing. Do you see a place for auto competition testing in verifying medical records, even day-to-day -day medical records? Absolutely. We use that in, in Kentucky. We also use it when I was, for my years in California too, where 
for example, clenbuterol. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a prescription, but if we find it in a out of competition sample, that's a trigger. Not that there is anything wrong with finding the clenbuterol, but it's a trigger to go back and review the medical record to make sure that the prescription had been appropriately turned in. So we can kind of uh, check, check and balances for medication use. And just for all of you, do, you know, I know that there are, just like any profession, there are amazing vets, there are great vets, there are great, you know, ethical vets, and then there are going to be some who aren't as ethical. So what do you think the risks are that even if we require all this to be recorded, that it won't be things like shockwave or diagnostics that can be done that could give us a lot of information as those trying to protect the horse, um, but could also, when they're not given to us or the information isn't given, could pose a substantial risk. I think that's true, Dion, in any profession or in any uh, area of work where you, you have to depend upon the integrity of the individuals involved. And I think we, we want to give people credit for doing the right thing and being honest about everything. But as I said earlier, there I can cite a number of, of cases where we have had a, uh, a, a test result or an investigative finding that would indicate one thing. And then we have medical records are not uh, supportive of that or they don't coincide with that. And, and when those situations occur, then, then there, there is a, a moment of truth where, where, where somebody's got to be uh, doing some explaining here, you know, to figure out what's going on. And I think that's what brings people up. I mean, yeah, it's not an everyday occurrence. We don't have our finger on the pulse of it every day, but, but these situations do regularly occur, where, as, as Will described or as I described, where we have information that indicates one thing. And if it doesn't line up with the documentation, then there's consequences for that. And so for those of you who, who, well, I mean, we all deal with claimed horses. Do you think that there should be special disclosure requirements for those horses that are actually transferring ownership as a part of a race? I, I do, Dion. I think that's really important. And I'd like if, if uh, Jamie, if you could please bring up the, uh, the horse health record, if you could, on the screen share for a moment. This, this is a, a document that was recently approved by the Mid-Atlantic Regulatory and Stakeholder Group that um, provides some really basic information. I think this is really a, a horse welfare issue, Dion, where, where we're talking about continuity of care. We're talking about trying to provide core information from the claimant, uh, from the, the claiming trainer to the claimant and the owner so that a horse has a, a, the, the best chance that they're new caretakers are going to be able to make informed medical decisions about these horses. And this is a document that originally started out from you, Dion. It was a document that was in, developed in California. And we had a committee look at this document. And, and like committees do, we changed it a little bit here and there. But the gist of it is this is a, essentially a one-page document uh, with, with an extra page for more data if you need to put it in there. But it's, it's re what we consider to be the core information that would be really helpful for a new trainer um, to have when they get a new horse in their barn. And as you can see, the top of the form here includes basic identification information, um, talks about um, whether the horse has had any unsoundness or EIPH in the last uh, recent time. So we, talk, we have opportunity to put in joint therapy, and then there's a list of, notice that there's immuno, excuse me, immunizations and, and deworming information in here. And we have a number of conditions we thought were pretty core to, to somebody would want to know if there were problems in this area. And then we basically followed up with an a, a opportunity to put other information in there that you think might be pertinent. But we think that this, there, is, there is some discussion about, oh, this takes a lot of work. You know, the veterinarians have to fill this out. And it's true that it does take some work. But I really believe it's really, really important mm -hmm. to have this information when horses are claimed. And I'll give you the, my primary justification for this is that we have epidemiologic data that came out of the equine injury database that horses that are claimed are at increased risk for fatal musculoskeletal injury for at least 30 days after the claim. And uh, part of that, we feel can, that risk can be mitigated if, if the new trainer gets appropriate medical information on the horse, they'll be able to make better decisions in terms of healthcare. So I think it's an absolutely important, critical piece of information. Well, and I have to admit that I stole this from Dr. Carpenter and Dr. Blea, actually private practitioners out in California were the ones who originally developed this. So um, I, we, we've been using it or we're in the process of adopting it in California. And I think it's very important also. Um, 
Dr. Carpenter, when you get in a horse from a trainer or from a um, someone like a pin hooker or just comes into the barn, how important do you think it is that the medical records come with the horse? So when do you think this requirement to maintain medical records and keep them throughout the horse's career or lifespan begins and ends? You know, I believe it begins on the farm, to be honest with you. Um, there's a lot of things that take place um, prepping a horse, either for a yearling sale or a two-year-old training sale, um, that would be very valuable as a racetrack practitioner. Um, you know, sometimes we um, deal with kind of the end product of the sales um, arena. Um, and sometimes we're just, um, you know, we have no idea what's going on. Um, I think the underlying tone of what we're hearing um, today is that the more information, the better. Um, you can't go wrong by providing more information. And so um, the more complete the medical record is, um, I think the better it is for everybody involved. And more importantly, it's the best thing for the horse. Yeah, and I, I will say as someone who has several off-the-track thoroughbreds, when I get that information coming but with the horse coming off the track, it's also helpful for me when I go to transition them to a new career. Um, so, Dr. Sorry, Dr. Palmer, I know that New York has, in certain circumstances, and you alluded to it earlier, large races, grade one races, um, has required the um, public disclosure of medical records in the 72 hours coming up to the race. I, I'm really interested in your opinion on whether you think that that actually changes how trainer or how trainers and veterinarians medicate the horse because sure. they know it is public. Absolutely. Uh, Jamie, could you please put up the, uh, the veterinary uh, New York State Gaming Commission treatment sheet? The form is VR1A. So this is the sheet that you're referring to, Dion, and this started in 2014 when I first became the Equine Medical Director in New York, and we had made a commitment to improve transparency. And as you remember, this was a period of time back in around 2014 when the Jockey Club had an initiative where they're trying to encourage owners to publish uh, the medical records of their horses before these major stake races. So kind of along the same vein, we thought, okay, we're going to take all these horses that are racing for in grade one races with a million dollars or higher purses. We're going we're to make them come to the racetrack uh, 72 hours before the race and we're gonna require that any treatment that they have in the 72 hours leading up to the race is listed on this form with the announcement and, and the owner's awareness that this medication record is gonna be put on our commission website every day at the end of the day. So it's gonna be a public facing document. And you'll notice on here that there's a, a space for diagnosis. And uh, then we have treatment, drug administered, dose and root administration. And what, what we found, Dion, is in the, when we first did this, there was a whole litany of treatments that were being put in there. And actually, they were, they were under diagnosis. There were comments like, at the trainer request. Yeah. And you know, it became necessary for me to remind veterinarians that being in a grade one race with a purse of a million or more was not a medical condition <laughs> that, that they could treat for. You know, so that changed the whole paradigm. When you have to publish this information to the general public, and you have to list a diagnosis. It really, I had a lot of conversation with the practitioners about this. We all got on the same page. It's going very smoothly right now, but I can tell you categorically that in the last six years that this form, the requirement to complete this form has dramatically reduced the amount of medication being given to a horse within 72 hours of a race. Right now, about the only thing you see in these forms are electrolytes, vitamins, some prophylactic uh, treatments like Adequan. <laughs> Um, and fennel, the non-steroidals at 48 hours, and that's about it. That there's really not much else that comes up here. So it's a, it's a very, it's been a very uh, useful uh, tool, and I think we're very comfortable with it here in New York right now. I, I have to, to say though, that begs the question: Why don't we do this for every race? <laughs> and I got to just be honest with you: We can't keep up with it all. We just couldn't. But um, if we could, wouldn't it be great? And and I think that, um, that this is a, a really great tool, something I'm, I'm really happy with over the past few years. I'd like to shift gears. You know, we, we only have an hour, and I feel like we could probably fill about four with what we're talking about. Um, and I want to talk about something that's actually very important to me that I think we've done, made excellent strides in California with, and that's monitoring horses between starts. Um, I want to, I'd like for each of you to talk about what you're doing in your jurisdiction or your tracks 
uh, to, to actually monitor horses between starts. Dr. Carpenter, given that, you know, you work at, at one of our tracks, I would love to hear your perspective of what you think is going on there. Yeah, so um, obviously um, we went through a rough time in California about a year ago, and um, fortunately through that time came a lot of really good. Uh, you couldn't see it when you were in the middle of it, but having been a year out of it, um, it it's definitely for the better. Um, a couple things that started in terms of monitoring was um, the requirement for a horse to be examined by the veterinarian. Uh, within five days of a work or three days of entering in a race. Um, that's really been great because what it does is it, it in the barns um, that have had a little bit more uh, rain, um, it, it's allowed the veterinarian to become part of the conversation a little bit more. Um, in kind of the bigger, uh, more, you know, well-defined oiled barns, um, a lot of that was taking place anyway. Uh, but th what this did was it made it a requirement for all. And so, um, that's been great. The other thing that's been um, really helpful from our end is the fact that there are actually veterinarians on the racetrack watching horses train every morning. Um, we all have had plenty of cases where the rider feels something, the trainer sees something, and you jog them in the shed row day after day after day, and you cannot see anything. And so you often find yourself walking up to the racetrack a few days later to watch and train yourself, and you can get a different perspective um, but I think as veterinarians on the backside, we don't have the time in our morning to do this every single day. And so it becomes something we do on occasion, but not routine. But there are a group of veterinarians that are out there every single morning watching these horses train. And so as we've developed our relationships with them, you know, they, you might get a simple phone call, hey, this horse looked a little short in the right front. Well, we'll come back and we'll look at it. And sometimes it's as simple as yeah, I know this horse had this and, you know, we've been treating it with, you know, for a proximal suspensory, we've been treating it with some butanoquazone and clinically he looks better. Okay, great. Um, you've had the conversation, but there's other times where you're like, well, okay, that's new to me. I haven't seen that aspect of this horse. Let's keep a little closer eye on him. Mm -hmm. And so it allows us to identify things, I think, early on um, by having that second set of eyes on the racetrack, watching him train every morning. And Dr. Farmer, I know that you're kind of settling into your job and just getting horses back on, at least at Churchill. Um, I assume you're at Churchill every morning. And um, what's your plan for the CDI tracks as you move forward? So very trying to replicate some of the some of the ideas that were started in California. Obviously, um, I don't have the staff yet uh, to be able to have somebody on the racetrack every day, but I am there every morning or at least most mornings. Uh, the KHRC also has veterinarians rotating through right now. Um, again, just trying to increase our visibility in the morning. Uh, the conversations that can be had when you're standing down on the rail with trainers, um, with the, the assistant trainers, are very beneficial. And then that helps to lead, that just leads to, to more um, lengthy conversations that can be had between the veterinarian and the trainer, if there is an issue that gets brought up, and sometimes we need to intervene. Sometimes those horses do need to be placed on a vet's list and, and protected. Um, but, you know, by and large, most of the conversations are just, hey, this is what we're seeing. And it allows, again, for the private practitioner to become a more interactive part of that horse um, and the care of that horse. And, and Dr. Palmer, with you know, numerous tracks and training centers, you have a similar challenge to what I have in that you're dealing with a lot of uh, uh, moving parts. How are you trying to monitor horses between starts in New York? Well, that's a, that's a you put a, hit the nail right in the head, Jan. That's a huge challenge for us. And, and I think the idea of getting eyes on the training tracks in the morning is great. We just don't have the manpower to be doing it all over the place where we would like to. I want to share one thing with you, though, that I think has been really helpful. And that's, um, this goes back to when we did the New York Task Force on Racehorse Health and Safety Work at Aqueduct in 2011 and 12. We, we created after that a, a racing risk management program in New York that includes a risk assessment and management of risk in four different levels. One of those levels is the individual horse risk factors. And, and that, that is an area where out of competition scrutiny or between race scrutiny of racehorses plays an incredibly important role. One of the things that I did in conjunction with the jockey club is I asked them to generate reports for me that I get every day. The report is a report of horses that are eligible to run. We have a work requirement that the horse has to have worked within 30 days of a race. And so I get a list of every horse stable in New York that is eligible to run at my racetracks. 
And then uh, what I did was I had them go through the, the, uh, the, their uh, Encompass database and, and we list all four-year-olds and older that are non-starters. We list all horses that have had 100 days or 120 days or longer of a layoff. We list all the horses that have had accumulated 80 or more high-speed furlongs prior to their first start. And we list all the horses that have ever been on the vets list. And we take these four criteria and look at them. And sometimes uh, we'll find a horse in there that meets all four of those criteria, which is a, which is a pretty scary horse. And so, um, you know, what, what typically happens then is, is I have either that trainer just to, and says, uh, I noticed that you've got a horse here that's, that's eligible to run here at Belmont. And we, we couldn't help but notice he's been off for quite a while and, and he's been on the vets list. And uh, we're just kind of curious about how he's doing. And the trainer, the first thing the trainer usually says is, who is this again and why are you calling me? I mean, that was that's the initial reaction. And then we have a conversation about it. And, and it maybe the horse would just had some surgery, had some throat surgery or something, has had a layoff and, and nothing is out of the ordinary. Or maybe the horse is a turf horse and it hasn't been running in the winter time and now it's just coming back. So there can be very benign explanations for these things, but it opens up the conversation, much like was said earlier by Ryan and Will. I mean, you, you start the conversation with this, this document that then gives you the opportunity to, to find out more about the horse and get comfortable with this horse. So I think that this out of competition scrutiny is, is really, really important. And the more of it that we can do, and some of it, I think we can use technology to help us do this. I know they're doing it in California the same, in the same kind of a watch list. But I think that, that, well, that's one way to address the scope of the problem, which is enormous, and where we can't put a regulatory veterinarian at every training center or every racetrack. But I think the use of technology through the Jockey Club's uh, uh, equine injury database and Encompass software is tremendously helpful. Yeah, and I, I think from our perspective, I mean, we do, um, we do look at, we require in California every horse that's going to do a time to work out Can I actually register. Sorry, Will, what was that? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. And once they register, we actually review their PPs that the racing office provides a set of PPs for us. And we make decisions about which horses we want to look at. And because of that, I think the more information that we have about individual horses and the more familiarity we have, um, the better we can make decisions about whether we're comfortable with them training or racing. And it really, as, as Dr. Carpenter said, it's, it's, really has to be done in concert with the private veterinarian. I think that those relationships are going to be invaluable as we move forward in the industry. Sorry, Dr. I think, Palmer. I think along Dr. Palmer's lines with regards to the use of technology and, and uh, some of the great reports that we're able to generate through um, the, the RTO track manager system that is, that is out there for our official uh, regulatory data keeping um, you know, is, is very handy because we can monitor our horse population. Again, there's relatively few of us and a lot of horses at our facility. So this is a, a quick way to scan um, and let the computer, let technology work for us to help us identify um, those individuals. Again, you know, maybe a very benign reason of why th their horse has been laid up or not training, um, but it, it allows the opportunity for the conversation to be had. And, and I think that that is being very well received by trainers, by the private practitioners, and, and with the regulatory veterinarians as well. I mean, it's the opportunity to, to build that relationship. I'd like to give you one more example, Dion, of, of something yeah. that also is helpful, not just, uh, I think the collaboration between practicing and regulatory veterinarians is, is a wonderful step forward. I think it's a huge, a huge advantage uh, for getting information. I think also, though, we can get information from other sources. And there was one case in particular that uh, came to my mind when I was preparing for this that I reflected on in terms of, of an instance where we were absolutely, uh, you know, sure that we prevented a horse's injury. It was a jockey up at Saratoga in 2018 that had a concern about a particular trainer. He had a couple of horses that he rode for this trainer, and he was very concerned about a couple of these horses. And he shared that information with the Naira Regulatory of Association Veterinarians, and they had some concerns based upon their examinations. And we all got together and started talking about this, and it became pretty clear that there were some horses that might be at significant risk here. I, I went to the, uh, the trainer and made an appointment. He had nine horses in the barn. I examined all nine horses. Two of those horses, I insisted they could not be entered unless he had a, a practicing veterinarian come by and take a look at them and uh, get a diagnosis. They were, two, they were very lame horses. <laughs> and so he did have them looked at. One horse had multiple carpal chip fractures in this one leg and the other horse 
had significant fiber disruption of a suspensory ligament in another leg. And uh, those two horses were, were retired. I mean, I, I'm absolutely certain that if, if that jockey hadn't made a point of talking to the association veterinarians and then communicated that with me, that, that one or two of those horses might have gone out and been seriously injured. So I think taking input from jockeys and exercise riders and anybody we can get is really valuable in doing this out of competition scrutiny between races. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about diagnostics because one of the things that we've done at Santa Anita with largely the practitioners leading the way is to um, really pull in and, and uh, improve diagnostic technology out there that's available to, to trainers and veterinarians. Um, Dr. Carpenter, can you talk a little bit about what's available, what you see as the future? Are any of these the type of, of um, technology that, that would be what would almost be a screening technique that would be required before a horse could train or, or race? Yeah, so we are very blessed here to have um, a bone scan, uh, nuclear scintigraphy. Uh, we have digital radiography, um, ultrasound. Uh, we've recently put in a standing MRI um, and a PET scan. And this is basically all um, because the Southern California Equine Foundation and the Stronic Group uh, commitment to the safety of the horses. And so I can tell you today with 100% certainty that we have saved horses' lives with these um, pieces of equipment, um, without a doubt in my mind. Um, Dr. Palmer and I had the privilege um, right before the world got shut down in March um, to um, gather with a group of veterinarians from around the world um, in Newmarket. And Dr. Pete Ramsden of Rosdells, this was kind of his um, idea of bringing experts from around the country to talk about um, diagnostic imaging tools and screening and areas that we can improve upon. The one thing that was made very clear um, at this meeting was there's not a one size fits all piece of equipment. And I think as veterinarians, we want the one thing. Is it the CT? Is it the PET scan? Is it the MRI? What is it that we can just do to prevent all of our problems? Um, but what we clearly identified was the strengths and weaknesses of each um, uh, technology. And I think this is going to be uh, the foundation that's going to really spring um, injury um, in related to the fetlock forward, because it's going to produce a lot of good research and it's going to produce a lot of good collaboration. Um, and I'm excited to see what will come from this meeting um, here in the coming years. Um, there will be a report published in EVJ um, in July that kind of summarizes uh, what we talked about. Um, but I think, you know, what I can tell you of, of as a practitioner in Southern California, um, I have all the bells and whistles at my fingertips and um, I can get them done in a very quick, efficient manner. Um, and through that, I can make very specific diagnosis and uh, recommendations on terms of can these horses safe to continue to train or should they go out for a rest and rehabilitation program um, and I think that's just something that's really important for why we're able to to practice at the quality of medicine that we can. And, and Dr. Farmer I know that in the spring um, Churchill Downs made a commitment to, to kind of develop a diagnostic center at Churchill. Um, any updates ongoing? What are you looking at? Yeah, we're very fortunate. Um, you know, that was the, the wheels were in motion before I joined Churchill, so I kind of have a blank slate. We have that, I think Will froze. We have a blank slate to facility, and the um, at this point, we're trying to work through the COVID situation, trying to uh, have conversations with practitioners because what we want to do is make sure that it's usable. There's no sense that we do something that maybe I personally feel would be a good, but they don't feel that. So this is a, a collaborative effort um, mm -hmm. where we want the horsemen and the veterinarians on the backside to be able to have a facility that can offer some mid-level care. Uh, it's not, it is not designed as a surgery center, um, but it will offer some mid-level care, some triage, um, some ice. There are some stalls in there. Um, that allow for a veterinarian to, that they, they can be utilized for some of that, uh, some, some care that they may want to do outside the barn, but it doesn't necessarily need to be shipped to a clinic. So uh, it's a blank slate right now. It's a blank canvas, and we're excited to pursue opportunities. Churchill is um, very eager to do whatever we can to help 
um, make sure that our horses at our facilities are as safe as possible. And, and so that's, we're, we're looking forward to being able to kind of flesh that facility out and, and be able to do that. And, and Dr. Palmer, you kind of have an interesting situation in that you have Belmont with the Ruffian Center right there. You have Saratoga with, you know, I know a Root and Riddle, Riddle Clinic right there. So you kind of almost have that benefit of the public-private or public, other public uh, entity partnerships that you can work on some of this stuff with. What are you, what are you planning for your tracks? Well, that's true, Dion. We do have, we are fortunate in that regard. I haven't worked much with the Root and Riddle group up at Saratoga, but we're doing quite a bit at the uh, uh, Ruffian Clinic uh, next to Belmont. And right now we're involved in a research project looking at a, a relatively new technology. It's, it's, a, a, uh, it's called uh, Digital Radiographics uh, Tomosynthesis, and it's a machine. Uh, basically, it's an x-ray generator that moves around in an arc around the horse's leg. And and similar to a CAT scan, it's not as, as it's, a CAT scan, of course, has got a 360 degree arc to it. So you have this wonderful three-dimensional reconstruction. And we don't have that, but we do have the ability to do a uh, partial slice through the bone and look at that. We're, 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 look, we're evaluating that technology right now to determine if we can use it to estimate bone volume fraction, for example. Uh, one of the we know we've known for 20 years that that changes in the subchondral bone, the distal cannon bone, and the sesamoids predispose horses to catastrophic injuries. We just have never been able to figure out exactly what the normal modeling process looks like, and how's that different from uh, a process that's gone off the rails before the horse actually becomes injured. And I, we're hopeful that this technology will help do that for us. We are also in the process of evaluating a number of different CAT scans. We have. We were very excited. We have a, a, a physicist on our staff at, at Cornell who is a uh, radiomics expert. And radiomics is, when I went to veterinary school back in uh, the 70s, you know, an x-ray was a picture that we looked at and we made an assessment or a diagnosis by looking at a picture. Radiomics takes all of the data on a digital x-ray and turns it into a numerical values that we can use to interpret things. It's machine learning. It's a, it's a way to look at x-rays in a very new way. And we're excited at Cornell that we're doing that right now. And, and uh, that's going to be a, a breakthrough for us, I think, in some regard. But right now we're finding, for example, that we're just evaluating different types of CAT scans. And, and all CAT scans are not equal. There are a number on the market. And we're using the radiomics technology to help us figure out which ones are actually going to give us the most information. So right now we're trying to look at three different types of CAT scans to find out which one we would like to purchase to, to do that. But we're heading in the same direction that you guys are doing in California. I don't, I don't think we'll ever have everything at our disposal quite like you do at San Diego. I think that's wonderful. But we will have, I'm, I think it's very likely we'll have a very high quality CAT scan and, and probably a PET scan along with it at some point. That is the, the kind of the rough direction in which we're heading. We already have uh, nuclear scintigraphy and, uh, you know, I, I just, uh, MRI, we've got that too. So, I mean, we'll, we're heading in a similar direction, but I think right now, because of the cost of this equipment, it's so expensive that, uh, and frankly, we had a very bad experience with a CT we installed a few years ago. The company that made it went bankrupt and wouldn't maintain it. And, and uh, we are <laughs> still quite uh, feeling the sting from that, uh, that poor business relationship and outcome. So we're, we're trying to do it right this time. And, and we're moving in that direction though. It's a very important thing. So, so I've left us roughly 10 minutes to talk, talk about the very important area of pre-race examination. So this is really poor planning on my part as time management. Um, Dr. Farmer, I know you've done probably hundreds if not thousands of pre-race examinations. Just so people understand, could you give us a brief synopsis of what you consider to be the pre-race examination that you do? Yeah, so, and I think that it's it's very fair to say that over the last decade, the pre-race examination has gone through a huge metamorphosis of what it once was to what it is today. Um, it definitely is much more in-depth than it ever has been before. Um, the value in the pre-race exam, I think, is uh, incredible, uh, not only to uh, the regulatory veterinarians, but I think it's also helpful to the trainers. I mean, I think that everybody are, is learning from are learning from these. So, you know, our pre-race exam when I first started um, was nothing more than palpation of the limbs in the stall. And then we added in, very quickly, we added in jogging. And it was amazing to see how that change alone, there are things that when a horse jogs that you just don't feel and the, the importance of uh, watching the horse move. And so, 
And now I think it's even continuing to evolve even more. Um, there's certain people like to add in um, like a neurologic, basic neurologic uh, aspect of it as well. I, I do. But I think Dr. Farmer locked up again. I do think one area that um, is, am I back? Yeah, you're back. You okay, sorry, I don't know why. I think one of the areas that we're starting to put more emphasis on uh, are the hind limbs. Um, you know, traditionally we have focused on the front limbs as being, you know, 90% of our on-track injuries occur in the front distal limbs. And so uh, there is still that 10% that occur other areas. And I think that the hind limbs are, are of importance. And I believe that we can get valuable and safe information by examining and doing a hind end uh, examination. And I uh, certainly don't know how many tracks around the country are doing that, but I do would say that that is increasing. Um, so we're, we're kind of having this all-encompassing exam um, to try and help uh, build a picture in a very short window of time with regards to the risk factors for that individual horse at that point in time. And Dr. Palmer, I know you got you in New York have added in some additional heart monitoring that you do on horses. Can you talk briefly about that? Sure. When I started in 2014, Dion, one of the problems that I was confronted with was in our necropsy program, we had a number of horses that experienced exercise-associated sudden death on our racetracks, and nearly 70% of those horses were necropsy negative, meaning that there was no obvious answer for, for what happened, which backs us into a diagnosis of a cardiac arrhythmia being the cause of death. And, and so I thought, well, gee, we probably ought to look at that a little bit. And so I got in touch with a company called Alive Corps from uh, United Kingdom, and they made a, a portable EKG machine. I'd just show it to you. Here is what it is. And it um, basically has, has two electrodes on the back of it, and you, you uh, moisten the skin with some alcohol, you hold it alongside the horse's body. And um, I don't know if you can see that, but there's an EKG on there of a horse that has a pretty normal EKG. This was one of the horses I looked at a couple of years ago. But anyway, this device is, is inexpensive. It costs about $250. And um, Interestingly, I've examined uh, more than 200 horses so far with this thing and, and have never found a cardiac arrhythmia where I would say this horse can't race. So, you know, that's, that's, the, that's true. With that said, though, um, I believe that we should at least be looking at these horses for arrhythmias. I, I know that horses have normal murmurs and I know they have normal arrhythmias that disappear at exercise. I also know that horses do die of exercise-induced arrhythmias. And I think that uh, the presence of atrial fibrillation um, or other significant arrhythmias, uh, if we find these things pre-race, uh, I think those horses should be scratched. And, and to be honest about it, if we don't look for it, we certainly never will find it. So I think that uh, it's something that takes a, a couple of minutes to do, but even if you just took a stethoscope and listened to the horse's heart rate, if, if the horse has a atrial fibrillation, which you can easily detect with a stethoscope, it takes 30 seconds to figure that part out, um, that's a horse that should not go out on the racetrack, in my opinion. So I think that that's something that uh, we need to be paying some attention to. I know there was a, a horse a couple of years ago that died in the unsaddling area of Pimlico on, on Pimlico Day in an undercard race. And I mean, it's such a horrible situation when it happens that I think we, we ought to do our due diligence to make sure that we at least screen them for something uh, before the race. All right, and Dr. Carpenter, as, as the phenylbutazone um, concentration or allowable concentration has moved in California, have you seen a difference in the, the horses that are scratched, whether they're scratched, have you seen any increase um, in, in the decisions made in the pre-race exam as a practitioner? Yeah, so I, I don't think that's made a big difference, to be honest with you. And if you had asked me that question a year ago when that rule was um, first put in our laps, I would have told you it would have made a big difference. Um, I kind of prescribed the, the, the line of thinking that if I can give my horses a little bit of butyrbanamine the morning of their work, they'll come out of their work better. They'll train uh, more consistently and they will miss less days for being kind of slightly sore um, as if I was, if I went out and ran this afternoon. Um, and to my surprise, that just wasn't the case. Um, the horses did great. Um, they don't need three non-steroidals leading up to a race. A single non-steroidal 48 hours is, is just fine. And I also have clients that 
you know, they'll say, you know, is this Butte two days before the race going to do anything on race day? And I say, no. And they say, well, then I'm not giving it. And they don't. And the horses run just fine. And so um, I think we have to acknowledge the fact that um, there's some areas of our industry we've got to let go of the grip that we've held on so tight um, because we've um, led ourselves to believe that there was a significant um, role in what we were doing. Um, and I think if we do that um, in some areas, we'll be surprised that um, those perceptions that we had um, over the years just weren't true. And um, the horses do just fine without it. Yeah. And Dr. Farmer, I, one of the things that's always surprised me in, that I've heard, and, and I guess maybe it shouldn't surprise me, but can you explain the phenomena of as we have gone through the pre-race exam and, and really the further we get into it, the fewer horses we scratch, it's not more horses that we're scratching, but really fewer yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it, it's the education that's happening. Um, you know, the the incentive, if you want to, from one side of the coin, the incentive to run a sore horse has been removed because a trainer realizes that that horse isn't going to make it to the racetrack, so they don't even try. Um, but I think a lot of it has to go back to the education. I mean, I, I do feel that uh, you know that when you when you draw a, when you set the bar and you have a consistent group of regulatory veterinarians who are looking at the horses. Um, you, you always have inner person variability, but if you can set the bar the same, um, and so trainers know, okay, I, when I, if I have a horse that doesn't meet that criteria, there's no sense in even entering them. And so I think that the, the education that has happened over the years um, and the, the, the disincentive that is now there to try and do that, because if you're going to try to push that envelope, that horse will go on the bets list. And so then there are consequences for that horse to come off of the list. And so I don't think there is the incentive there to do that anymore. And again, it, it really, I, in my mind, goes back to the education of the trainers. Yeah. Okay, so we only have a few minutes left, and I know there are some questions, but I just want to wrap up by asking each of you two questions, and if you could each take turns answering them. First of all, what do you think the most significant improvement we've made in the past five years in horse safety and welfare, and where do you think we have the most work to do? So we'll start with you, Dr. Palmer. I think without doubt, the most significant thing change that's happened in the last uh, six years to help us reduce racetrack fatalities is risk management. We have aggressive risk management protocols in place that we didn't have before. And the fatality rate, for example, in New York is well below 40% of what it used to be uh, six years ago. And it's a sustained improvement. I don't think there's any question that we're having a positive effect on it. I think that the the, the better we can do at out of competition screening and uh, out of competition scrutiny and pre-race screening, the better job we can do with that, we're, we'll take this thing another step forward. Right now, we're with the basic epidemiology, we're at about 65% predictability of accuracy of identifying a horse that should be scratched or not, and that's not quite good enough. And I think with this new technology and with, with enhanced um, cooperation between practicing veterinarians and regulatory veterinarians and trainers and with the ability to combine epidemiologic uh, uh, markers, if you will, with imaging markers, we're going to be a lot better off in terms of, of saving horses' lives. I don't think there's any question about that. So I'm very excited about the future and I think that it's, it's a thrill to be a part of it. Dr. Farmer, what about you? Uh, my answer is one and the same. It's the fact that it's this inter-race uh, risk management that goes on. Again, kind of going with Dr. Palmer. I mean, we have made leaps and bounds in the last uh, five, six, seven, eight years. Still have still have work to do. I mean, it is a very challenging thing, not only from um, uh, actually assigning and looking at the risk factors, but just having the manpower to do it and being creative with that. Um, it's a very expensive thing to get done, um, but the horse is worth it. And the it is the, um, the amount of that done in that inner race period, uh, I think is very, very valuable. Okay, what about you, Dr. Carpenter? So um, along the same lines, um, the, the rule that we instituted in California that's begun the change in the culture on the backside of the racetrack was the voiding the claim rule. Um, the fact that um, if your horse um, you can't pass off your problem to somebody else um, that, that will be voided um, and uh, it'll be returned to you. That was the beginning of a cultural shift um, um, that has um, basically taken place over the years. And so that's, um, 
uh, what we need to do in the industry is change the culture. Uh, where we need to go from here is we've got to have uniformity. Um, the Thoroughbred Safety Coalition um, did an amazing thing, um, just bringing all the stakeholders to the table to begin the conversation. Um, but surprisingly, some stakeholders said, no, we don't want to be part of that. Um, and I think as an industry, we need to say that's not acceptable. Um, we need uniformity. Uh, we need a centralized voice, um, whether it be through the Thoroughbred Safety Coalition or federal legislation. Um, how we get there, I'm not sure is, um, is as critical as that we get there. Um, for the value of our thoroughbred racehorse uh, moving forward, we have to be on the same page and we have to be unified in our voice. Well, thank you each again. I'm going to turn it back over to Jamie because I see there are quite a few questions and I'll let him answer or ask them. Yeah, first of all, I'd just like to say thanks, guys, to all of you taking time out of your day. We know you have a lot going on with racing, getting going back. So uh, a few quick questions, um, some that have been listed, some start uh, emailing to me as well while we're going. But I think the first one is going to be directed at Dr. Carpenter, and that is our – uh, private veterinarians privy to the training schedules of the horses you treat and do you kind of know the demands on a daily basis of those horses? I think that's a um, question that you have with your trainer. Um, every time I look at a horse, uh, the first question I ask is, what's this horse been doing? Um, are they coming in off a layoff? Are they, do they work their first five eights? You know, are they a week away from running? Um, so while you may not go look at the training chart every day, um, I think a simple um, question to your um, to the person you're working with um, can fill that information very easily. Thanks. And then another, I think this would be directed to Dr. Palmer, and it says, "Are you aware of uh, any potential biomarkers associated with shockwave therapy that may be included in your testing?" And they suggested uh, Chin et al. study in 2019, if not. The biomarkers for shockwave therapy were first discovered by a fellow named Larry Soma at the Pennsylvania Laboratory from the University of Pennsylvania. And when Larry retired, uh, he had made some early progress in this area, but, but uh, you know, it, it wasn't complete. Mary Robinson has taken over this work and she's doing a good job. And maybe he comes back? Well, so uh, we're waiting on Dr. Palmer to uh, unfreeze on my end at least. This will be, uh, Dr. Palmer had alluded to uh, the screenings of heart checks in New York and somebody wanted to know if that's routinely being done in California or Kentucky. So for California, we aren't routinely performing that. What we are doing is we are trying to, we are working with the, the University of Minnesota who is investigating a potential genetic link between um, sudden death and obviously the genes of the horse. So as we are ha having injuries or sudden deaths at any of our tracks, we are providing hair samples to see if there is some kind of familial screening that we can do to actually um, find these horses before they uh, hit the track. Because in most cases, you know, a horse that is uh, there aren't many that actually horses that prior to training and certainly Dr. Carpenter and Dr. Farmer can um, give their opinion, but there aren't many that are in AFib when they're just standing. And Dr. Farmer, what about Kentucky? Are they doing any screens there? You know, I, I would, from a screening standpoint, no, um, but they do, uh, any horse that is picked up, especially for a non-distal limb injury where there might be a question, they all do have stethoscopes. So in that emergency situation, um, they're able to put a stethoscope on the horse and then auscultate to see if there is a cardiac issue. Certainly any horse that, that collapses for an unknown reason, um, that's their first go-to. As long as, you know, if, if the, the rule out of a, a distal limb injury is, is not there, um, and we're trying to figure out why is this horse down or, or the issue that might be going on. It's definitely done, um, but not as a, not, I wouldn't say it's done as a screening tool at this point. Gotcha. Well, let's see, Dr. Arthur, or excuse me, Dr. Palmer, not Arthur, has uh, dropped off due to some technical difficulties. So there was actually a couple questions related to New York. So I'll try to follow up and get those. Um, I just wanted to again say thanks to everyone uh, for taking your time today to do this. 
Uh, we've got three more uh, scheduled every Tuesday at two. Uh, next week will doctor be uh, Dr. Mick Peterson, uh, which I know all of you all work with in uh, equine medical directors. You wouldn't think work, but uh, Dr. Peterson is an integral part in everything that we, uh, we're doing in the industry for uh, promoting safety, especially uh, racetrack safety. So he'll be uh, next week and then uh, followed will be Dr. Jennifer Durnberger and Sue Stover talking about her uh, work out of the California necropsy program. And then finally, <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Tim Parkin will deliver the new equine injury database statistics. And uh, Dr. Mary Scalay, who assisted him in getting that off the ground, is going to do a moderated Q&A. So uh, if you guys have questions for them, uh, let us know. Again, thanks so much, everyone, for showing up today. And we really appreciate the time you've taken out of your days, Dr. Carpenter, Dr. Benson, Dr. Farmer. Uh, safe Thank racing. You. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Guys. Thank you for having us.